Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it is that time once again. Monday evening, 5 p.m. here, 7 p.m. out there on the East Coast. It is today, December 9, 2019, and I am Grimner, and this is the Grim Leftovers Show, right here live on reallibertymedia.com, as the little intro said, and rlmradio.xyz, as well as a host of other places that we go out to. Let me say hi and howdy to all the folks out there on uh, places like reallibertyorg freedomsnetwork.com, internetradio, tunein.com, and all that such stuff. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I was not couch surfing. I, I, I just uh, had limited time before the show uh, due to other circumstances uh, that I was doing. Uh, a- a- anyway, <laughs> hopefully you're all ready for some interesting, fun stories. I, w- I wanted to share with you because I, I don't know if I've shared this on the show before, but uh, I, I go over here to my blog post page. Uh, the Grim Leftovers uh, podcast blog page, and read to you the uh, kind of little intro that is there every every week in my blog posts. It says, This show offers you a non-mainstream, non-propagandized analysis of not-so-fresh news stories. The world is a crazy place, and almost always because of people's belief in authority. Or, authorita, if you prefer. <laughs> and that's what it comes down to, really. It's a crazy place, almost always, almost always, because of people's belief in authority. That stuff is bad for you. Authority, the belief in authority, is really, really bad for you. And uh, hopefully you'll take that to heart and, and understand that the authority means you no good at all whatsoever. Anyway, let me say hi to all the folks here in the chat. We got a nice group of folks here in the chat. We always do. We got people like the barman. People. He's not really a person. Just a bot. Just a bunch of lines of code. We got Beetle and Cowboy Tech and myself and the Moose Girl. Uh, we got Miss Kate. The wonderful Miss Kate. Anti Asmodeus Asmo. Chelsea Donate the Java Doctor. Hansel. Hey, Hansel, you listening in? Are you tuned in? Probably not. We know how you are. You're a Hans. Hans type guy. J Dread, as he goes. Uh, Meister Brow, Bondergander. Bondergander. The uh, Poopster and Prince, who will be on Thursday night with their show, The Power Hour. Oh, yeah, Pondergander will be on Friday afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern with his show, A Pondergander. <laughs> we got Rob Works. Hey, Rob, uh, passing the bubbler around. Good old. Good man, good man, Mr. Realms there, yes indeed, Vanna White, she's a, she's our, our, one of our favorite bots, Mr. Vin E, the other, one of the other personalities of Pondergander, we got the weather dork that gives us the weather and tells us when other people posted links, we got Phantom 2, CC66, Joskera, Circle, a hey, lovely Miss Circle, uh, we have Cyborg Noodle, and uh, that's a half-bot, half-human. It's a cyborg. Well, Miss uh, Damn Van Meter, yep, 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 we like her. Uh, duh, duh, hey, duh, what's going on, man? Uh, E-Man and Siv, uh, Frumpy the Frumpstar. And Frumpy is also at work. Goob, Goob. <laughs> Gooberzilla. Uh, from Gromit and JJ's and Pone Sauce. The sock puppet himself, uh, SLC Mike out there in Utah, SLC. Yes, the Slim Jim Slim. Eh. And the holiest of Rogers. Holy Roger, holiest Roger. Yes, indeed. All these great folks here. Come on over, jump in the chat, say hi to all these folks, and uh, just make comments about stuff, you know? That's what people do here. Yeah. Well, we better kick it off. I got a, I got a load of stories loaded up for you all in... Huh, none of them are all that good for you. 
<laughs> well, maybe one or two. We'll see. Uh, all right. From the Daily Mail, uh, posted on the 24th of November, could humans, you folk, be put into hibernation? Scientists hope periods of suspended animation could help cure cancer, prevent diseases, and give us, us, the ability to conquer distant planets. Now, you notice, it doesn't say to visit distant planets. It doesn't say to be a tourist on different distant, distant planets or uh, make, make friends with people on different planets. No, it says conquer. It wants you to conquer distant planets. <laughs> that's the way they think. <laughs> it's just messed up thinking, but that's, that, that's it, man. All right, here. Uh, when they're looking for ideas for their next futuristic blockbuster, Hollywood's movie moguls could do worse than visit the University of Maryland Medical Center in the American city of Baltimore. In 2012, doctors there carried out one of the world's first successful face transplants. Like that movie Face Off, kind of. Not. And earlier this year, they pioneered using drones to transport a donor kidney. Both were remarkable achievements, but they pale when compared with news that surgeons at the hospital have placed a human being into a state of what is being called suspended animation. No details are known of the patient who is thought to have arrived with a stopped heart having at least half of their blood, having lost at least half of their blood. Uh, these symptoms are consistent with a gunshot or stab wound, common in a city with a notoriously high violent crime rate. Now, there's a big city near me uh, called Albuquerque, and apparently they're way high on the list of uh, those violent crimes as well. And I, and I think they, they, they said uh, that so far this year in Albuquerque, there have been 74 homicides breaking the previous record of the number of homicides in that city. So, and it's, uh, you know, we still got like three weeks left. So, uh, hooray! New skyrocketing murder records for Albuquerque. Aren't you so lucky? <laughs> Surgeons operating on such trauma cases have barely any time to save a victim's life. At a normal human body temperature of 37 degrees or 98.6 Fahrenheit, we can survive only about five minutes without a heartbeat to pump oxygen to our cells. After that, the damage to the brain is irreversible and survival rates are around 5%. Now, recently I rewatched the, the movie Flatliners and they were pushing it to five minutes on uh, some of their flatline fun test experiments. Of course, it was a movie. It wasn't real, as far as we know. It could have been a documentary. I'm not sure. <laughs> In this case, however, the patient's body was chilled to around 10 to 15 degrees C, 50 to 59 degrees F, by replacing their blood with an ice-cold saline solution. This almost completely stopped both their brain activity and the chemical reactions taking place in their body cells, giving the surgical team up to two hours, which is far more than five minutes, to fix their injuries. Uh, whether, the person, uh, whether the person concerned survived once they had been warmed up, had their blood restored, and their heart restarted has not been disclosed. But <laughs> Professor Samuel Tisherman and his team plan to carry out the procedure on more patients in a trial, with the results out in late 2020. So we got another, another whole year to wait on the results on whether or not any of these people they do these things to actually survived. Uh, revealing his research in an exclusive interview with New Scientist magazine, Professor Tisherman admitted that seeing someone in limbo, limbo low now, between life and death was a little surreal. 
Yet such techniques may one day be commonplace with medicine already cooling the human body to extremely low levels, bringing metabolism to a near stop. Hey, Graham V! Awesome! <laughs> Graham V made it home just in time to get the leftovers. Yes, we got some mighty, mighty tasty leftovers for you, Grammy. Dig in. <laughs> anyway, this has been inspired by an, uh, by amazing stories of survival, where both children and adults have been clinically dead for hours, but survived because their bodies had become incredibly cold. I do believe we talked about a story like this on Friday night's Freakers Ball show, where a woman was frozen out there in the tundra for six hours basically dead. They thought she was dead, but then she warmed up and she was not quite so dead. Yeah, she got better. <laughs> Take radiologist Dr. Anna Bengelholm, who, in 1999, was skiing in Norway when she crashed through the frozen surface of the stream and became trapped under the ice. After 40 minutes, she suffered a cardiac arrest as will happen when you're frozen to death. Her friends finally managed to drag her free, but the rescue hop helicopter took 90 minutes to arrive. When she arrived at the hospital, her heart had stopped for more than two hours, but the extreme cold had protected her vital organs from damage, putting her in a state of suspended animation. Despite the oxygen deprivation, four and a half hours later, Dr. Bagginholm fell through the, uh, after Dr. Bagginholm fell through the ice, her body had slowly been warmed and her heart restarted. She made an almost full recovery and eventually she returned to work. Uh, they're showing a picture of here of some black bears that, yeah, they hibernate, like, annually. Her story led to doctors worldwide developing a technique called therapeutic hypothermia. Hypothermia is not necessarily typically uh, considered to be therapeutic, but I guess if it saves your life. Victims of heart attack, injuries, and stroke, and newborn babies who suffered a lack of oxygen at birth are cooled to extremes to slow the process of deterioration dramatically and given medical teams the time to treat them. The difference between such cases and the latest developments in the U.S. is that those patients are brought to a temperature of about 35 degrees C or 95 Fahrenheit, which is barely below your normal operating temperature, although it constitutes hypothermia, is still far higher than the 10 to 15 degrees C achieved in Baltimore. That was inspired by an accident, uh, an incident early in Professor Tishman's career, dealing with a youth who had been stabbed in the heart. Ugh, he was a healthy young man, just minutes before, then suddenly, he was dead. Dead! We could, could have saved him if we had enough time, he says. So, beyond giving the, sur the surgeons, as, such as Professor Tishman, more time to operate, such extremely low temperatures could one day help combat cancer with research suggesting that patients in this state might be able to tolerate fi far higher doses of radiation without healthy tissue, healthy tissues being harmed. Radiation. Uh, I'm going to pass. I don't want none of that radiation. Anyway, there's more to the story, should you care to read it, but I think you got the idea now. Uh, if you're ever out there in the frozen tundra and you get shot, or shot at, or stabbed, or something else terrible happens to you, just freeze yourself to death. <laughs> and maybe they can revive you. I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. All right, from uh, Stat News. Stat, next, next story. Statnews.com, posted on November 25th. Elizabeth Clooney. Some brain-boosting supplements contain an unapproved drug that could harm users, study warns. Now, they're here in this title, 
without going any further than this, relating the word, the term, unapproved, with harm. Just because this government body, depending on where you live, if you're here in the States, the FDA, uh, yeah, they did not approve it, therefore it may harm you. Of course, when you look at many of the things, that the FDA has approved and continues to approve, many of those things do cause actual harm and death. <laughs> so um, just bear that in mind as I, as I share this with you. Promising to lift brain fog or improve memory, Brain-boosting supplements have joined sexual enhancement and weight loss remedies in the lightly regulated, and again, they, they put that word regulated in there as if that's a good thing, as if their regulation makes something better, the lightly regulated world of dietary supplements. These products may be sold legally with a broad brush come on like as long as they don't make specific claims about treating a disease or contain actual drugs, which the definition of actual drugs is very sketchy, to say the least. New research led by Dr. Pieter Cohen of the Harvard Medical School documents five supplement brands for sale in the United States that contain various amounts of a thing called piracetam. P-I-P-I-R-A-C-E-T-A-M, paracetam, paracetam, something like that. A drug prescribed in European countries for cognitive impairment in dementia, but not approved in the United States. But it's there, and these people admit it. The FDA does not allow paracetam to be sold as a dietary supplement, and has issued warning letters in the past to other companies marketing supplements that contain it. Though, and to me, the fact that it's approved over there in the Euro lands, but it's not approved here in the U.S. lands, uh, tends to make me think that it does something really, really good for people. And so the FDA does not want that approved here because it would affect the profits of some of their big pharma managers, because FDA is run by people from big pharma. So, though the drug is approved in Europe, evidence for using paracetam to improve cognition was inadequate. Really? A Cochrane review analyzing 24 studies that enrolled more than 11,000 patients concluded in 2012, seven years ago. And still, they don't have this information? Cohen and his colleagues reported in JAMA Internal Medicine on Monday of the week this article came out that paracetam is listed as an ingredient on the labels of five supplements for sale online. Relentless Improvement, Nootropics, and Specialty Pharmacy sold their products as Piracetum, BPS based on its supplement uh, Compel and Cognitive Nutrition, called its NeuroPill, but included Piracetum on the label. Makes me think maybe I want to go and check out some of these brain boosters for myself and see if they can boost my brain. It seems kind of bold to put a non-approved substance on a label, said Dr. David Serres, associate professor of medicine at the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University Medical Center, who was not involved in the study. It's horrifying, but it's not terribly surprising. Why is it horrifying? Just because it's non-approved? <laughs> oh, but then we get to this here. And, and this is what they say. Not necessarily what's true, but what they say. Side effects of paracetam include agitation, anxiety, and depression. 
Yeah, maybe you have agitation, anxiety, and depression if your brain's not working right anyway. But that's when, uh, uh, when prescribed at a standard dose of the drug, whose mechanism of action was described in one research paper as an enigma. In Europe, older patients tend to be prescribed lower doses, Cohen said, to account for the reduced kidney function that comes with age. That could be a concern for an older person seeking help with memory problems. Cohen, who also practices internal medicine at Cambridge Health Alliance, worries that consumers could be taking a drug under no medical supervision. Oh, no, we don't have one of those medical yahoos telling us exactly what to do and how to do it and when to do it at a dangerous dosage. In the study, Cohen's team found a wide variation in how much paracetam a person could be ingesting. You just do not know from day to day if you're getting zero of a drug or if you're getting an amount that is more than a prescription. Oh, you got to have a prescription. If you don't have a prescription, then what good are we? Uh, you're no good. It seems like this is a case where the FDA knows something's not permitted, Cohen said. They know it's still on sale and they haven't used their full enforcement power. Enforce meant power, nor have they informed the public that this is out there and should be avoided or not. Uh, anyway, I'll let you check it out, but um, I, I, I think that maybe you, you might want to try some of these, uh, some of these unapproved or drugs, uh, supplements, supplements, don't want to call them drugs, calling them drugs would be bad. <laughs> some of these unapproved supplements and uh, for yourself and see if maybe they do actually provide brain boosting uh, capabilities do you have a paro seed uh -huh. very funny Vinny <laughs> paro seed um Now, I know here in New Mexico, next, the next article, by the way, I know here in New Mexico, we have in uh, the eastern parts of the state, uh, eastern and southern parts of the state, many feral hogs. I know that, that uh, where um, Woodman uh, is over there in Arizona, he also has uh, many feral hogs and javelinas. And also in Texas, they do in some areas run rampant. Which brings us to this story. Tragic, tragic. Texas woman killed by feral hogs in tragic rare incident. Christine Marie Rollins, 59, uh, attacked outside of a home in Anahuac, Anahuac, <laughs> whatever, in one of the most, one of the worst cases I've ever seen, County Sheriff says. Is there, an, is there a date on this article? Oh, there it is. Uh, the 26th of November, 2019, theguardian.com. A 59-year-old Texan woman has died after being assaulted by feral hogs in what the uh, country sheriff described as one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Christine Marie Rollins, 59, a health care worker, arrived to look after an 84-year-old patient who she had been caring for for almost two years, when she was attacked in the early hours of a Sunday morning. Uh, Sheriff Brian Hawthorne said he would not go into the gruesome details of the incident, but said she was uh, disturbed by the attack. He was disturbed by the attack. Uh, in a statement, he said, This is an unbelievably tragic, very rare incident. In my 35 years, I will tell you it's one of the worst things I have ever seen. And you could just imagine. Uh, I don't know if you've seen many of these wild hogs out there, but they got some big old teeth and tusks on them, big claws. They're, they they are mean critters too, by the way. Uh, Hawthorne said that the bites and bruises of varying sizes made it clear that multiple animals were involved in the attack. Well, they do travel in packs. He said the pigs had taken over some of the pasture and woods of the family land. 
The issue of feral hogs in the United States has been bubbling under the surface, depending on where you live. Uh, a lot of places it's been bubbling over the surface. I, I know they take down cattle and horses here in New Mexico. Um, so taking down a person's, uh, eh, not that, uh, that, that's, you know. Anyway, in August, self-proclaimed libertarian William McNabb became a viral sensation when he waded into a debate on gun reform by posing the question, how do I kill the 30 to 50 feral hogs that run into my yard within three to five minutes while my small kids play? Um, big guns, lots of them. Lots of lots of rounds in those in those clips. Uh, multiple news out, outlets, including the Guardian, raced to see how much of an issue wild hogs really are in the United States. According to the USDA, there are about five million feral hogs in the United States, half of which are in Texas. They cause billions in damage every year, destroying wild local wildlife and native habitats, and disturbing locals. However, the USA does not recommend shooting as a method to control groups of pigs, which can weigh between 100 and 400 pounds. Uh, what do you recommend? Huh? 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 You don't, do you? Hawthorne, the, the police sheriff, uh, said that there have been six deaths by feral hogs reported in U.S. history. A university in Nebraska paper from 2013 put the total number of wild hogs Killings in the U.S. history at four. Rollins died outside a home in Anahuac, near Houston, with multiple injuries to her body. An autopsy said she had died from exsanguination, bleeding to death, due to feral hog assault. Hawthorne said officials had immediately believed the cause of death to be animal attack, but it was not something we could have even come close to announcing until we had the official, authoritative uh, cause of death. See, they, they don't mention here, anywhere, uh, what the USDA does recommend as, as a method of controlling these feral hogs, dealing with these feral hogs. They just say, oh, we don't want you using guns for that. Using guns? What are you, some kind of cowboys? <laughs> Follow that, authority. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want authorities, the authority, uh, being upset because you're using a non-approved brain-boosting supplement or saving your own life with a gun. <laughs> no, that would go against their very reason for being. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. All right, <laughs> next article, SlashGear.com. Eric Abent, that's his name, Abent, uh, on November 26th. Alexa, you know Alexa, right? She, 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 I say she, I'm not really a she, is that voice that comes to you from Amazon. She, Alexa, can now remind you to take a medication and refill your prescription. Excuse me. All you got to do <laughs> is tell her all about yourself and your medical history. <laughs> yeah. uh, Amazon today announced that Alexa is getting some new medication management features. These features not only include reminders to take your medicine, something that was already doable with Alexa's capabilities, but also the ability to request refills for your medication. So she'll just order up some drugs and have them shipped on over to you, and then tell you, beep, 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 take them damn drugs. Ah... <laughs> uh... The launch of these features is starting out on a small scale, but we should see it expand in the near future. In its announcement today, Amazon said that in uh, in the years since it launched Alexa, 
It has been receiving feedback from a lot of users who claim to use the assistant for daily medication reminders. Don't people don't people do anything for themselves now? Well, when's Alexa gonna start just injecting the drugs into your body, directly into your your, your veins? You know, <laughs> just get the the wearable uh, Alexa with injection <laughs> capability. <laughs> just <laughs> ah! All right. Anyway. Amazon built out the uh, re reminder functionality in response to this feedback, but these new features essentially take things one step beyond. Uh, instead of making users uh, set their own reminder parameters, these new features let them do it using their pharmacy prescription information. All you got to do is give them the little number on your prescription and it'll know exactly what drugs you need to take and when you need to take them. Amazon says that it teamed up with the OmniCell to develop this functionality, and it's first going live at Giant Eagle Pharmacy, which operates in the Midwest and East Coast regions of the good old U.S. of A. To get started using it, you'll need to enable the Giant Eagle skill you know, um, I, I listen to this radio sh station, uh, online radio station, for, out of Oregon, uh, Medford, Oregon, KMED. And this was the first time listening to them, because that's where I, I listened to Coast to Coast up there, uh, and, and since it doesn't come in locally here. Um, so I listened to, to uh, KMED out of or Medford, Oregon. And they were talking about their, their app, their Android app. I think it was an Android app. might have been an uh, Amazon, uh, what do you call those? Was Amazon tablet apps, um, <laughs> and they said you have to enable the the KMED skill, and I'm like, what? What the hell is that? But apparently, that's one of their names of the of the apps. If you can enable instead of installing an app, you enable a skill. It's it's weird. It's just a it's just a odd phraseology to me that that your Electronic assistants <laughs> have skills. <laughs> a little sidebar there. <laughs> no, they, I just, I just find it odd. I, that's all. Anyway, so enable the giant eagle skill and then link your accounts. If you don't already have an Alexa voice profile, Alexa voice profile. Yeah, no, I, I don't have an Alexa voice profile and. I'm pretty sure I don't want an Alexa voice profile so it knows that it's me talking whenever I'm talking and it can hear me. No, I think I'll pass on the Alexa voice profile. <laughs> You'll be prompted to create one along with a passcode. And when that's done, you can say, Alexa, manage my medication to set up reminders or Alexa, refill my prescription, which it'll do automatically regardless of whether or not you tell it to. Uh, you can even ask Alexa to tell you which medication you should be taking when one of those reminder alerts goes off. Now what I'm waiting for is the Alexa doctor, the one that says, I, I think you have this. Or that, or please describe to me <laughs> your your symptoms, and I will diagnose you, uh, write out a prescription, fill that prescription, and send it to you, and tell you when to take them. Until we come up with that Alexa injection band that you'll be wearing on on your body, Alexa will take care of you every step of the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's going too far. It's 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 over. It's over the freaking line, man. <laughs> oh, Giant Eagle. I thought Giant Eagle was a gas station. I, I know they have Eagle gas stations. I thought it was Giant Eagle gas stations they have here in New Mexico, but apparently it's a something more than that. At least as far as Alexa's concerned. Uh, I I I. I <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. 
I, I would not be pleased. I mean, if I uh, frequented medical doctors, medical folks of any kind, I would not be happy with this whole Alexa thing uh, if I was to partake in it. Uh, having an Alexa voice profile, not good. I, I don't see that as a good thing. I, I see this as very too too big brotherish for big brother to even comprehend. This this is just you got to you got to rely on yourself to do some things. And I'm thinking uh, if you you do use medication and 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 uh, have to take it on a regular uh, basis and and get uh, prescription refills, do it yourself. Don't let some little piece of crap electronics tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Uh, exactly, Frumpy Works says, help you into the afterlife. Uh, exactly. <laughs> man, oh man. <laughs> I'm going to pass on all that wonderful Alexa stuff. <laughs> well, I wonder when they, they're going to come out with the Alexa girlfriend and they can send you out like a, uh, you know, one of those uh, sex robots. Named Alexa. Hi, I'm Alexa. I'm here to make you feel good. <laughs> yes, modern day Dr. Kevorkian. <laughs> Thanks, Sock. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. All right. From Reuters.com on November 27th. Japan clears restart at the Fukushima nuclear reactor. <laughs> or it's, as it says here, the nuclear reactor closest to the epicenter of 2011 quake. So Japan's Tokuhu Electric Power said on Wednesday it has one initial regulatory approval to restart the reactor at its Onagawa power plant, more than eight years after the damage, uh, after it was damaged by the earthquake and tsunami caused by the Fukushima disaster. So this, I guess, not actually the uh, the Fukushima power plant, but the Ana, Anagawa, Anagawa, which nobody's ever heard of, because it's not Fukushima. <laughs> Tokuhu Electric said in a statement, it has received the first green light from Japan's nuclear regulatory authority. To restart the number two reactor at Onagawa, subject to public consultation period. Rome says it's too late. Alexa and these little gadgets are the first step to everyone becoming dependent on them. I, I think it is. I think it's obvious that uh, the most of the general population out there is extremely dependent upon their little gadgets. It, it, it is disturbing. By the way, I am watching a show on Amazon. Thank you, Alexa. Uh, on Amazon Prime Video uh, called The Feed. And it does take things another step further. It's uh, I've only watched the first two episodes so far. It's like a 10 episode uh, series. Um, <laughs> very interesting though these first two episodes and uh, if, if anybody's got the Amazon Prime you might want to check out the feed and uh, see where some of this stuff is going of course a lot of you can get it with Black Mirror uh, Black Mirror talks a lot about these type of things as well and there are plenty of other movies and uh, other shows that talk about uh, th this type of stuff but uh, it's crazy it's crazy <laughs> Onagawa was the closest among Japan's nuclear stations to the epicenter of the magnitude 9 quake in March 2011, which triggered a tsunami that killed 20,000 people, as well as causing the worst atomic disaster since Chernobyl, uh, maybe even greater than Chernobyl, in 1986. The station was swamped by the tsunami, but survived with its cooling systems intact, saving its reactors from the threat of meltdowns similar to those that occurred 
at uh, Tokyo Electric Power's Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi Station to the south. Further approvals will be required before the restart, along with the consent of local authorities. Local authorities, which is not guaranteed, but nothing about the local people. The local people have no say. It's the authorita. <laughs> oh, God. The reactor is a boiling water reactor with the same basic design as those that melted down in the Fukushima crisis. Tokuhu Electric expects to spend 340 billion yen or 3.1 billion dollars on safety upgrades at the Onagawa plant. Uh, you're welcome, Granny. I'm not sure what for or what tip. But yeah, you're welcome. Uh, including the wall, wall stretching 800 meters in length and standing as tall as 29 meters above sea level to protect it from tsunamis. Do you think that's adequate? I'm not sure it is. If you get another 9.0 quake, is that wall going to continue standing? And if it doesn't, and a tsunami comes in, how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> Restarting the number two reactor will save the utility 35 billion yen per year in fuel costs, he said. So, uh, 10 years to get your money back, I guess. The Fukushima disaster led to the eventual shutdown of the country's then 54 operational reactors, which provided nearly a third of all of Japan's electricity. All had to be re-licensed under new standards, after the disaster highlighted operational regulatory failings. Yeah, thank <laughs> Oh, God. So, anyway, uh, keep an eye open. This is not, it's not going yet, but they've gotten the first step of approval to restart this, this, uh, reactor there. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how many, Reactors are presently running there in Japan, but uh, um, they, like I said, they they all had to be re, re, re licensed after this. But they wanted to get them going again, so I would imagine many of the, them. Oh, for the Amazon. Oh, right, sure, yeah, yeah, the feed, cool. All right. <laughs> Speaking of the feed, let's talk about a different kind of the feed. This is an older article uh, from January of 2018, so almost uh, two years old now. But I thought it was worth bringing up because I wasn't really aware of it myself until I saw this article. Some of y'all may be aware of this. I was not. And, and I haven't really seen this out there anywhere. But it, 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 it probably is. And I just haven't caught on. This is uh, posted on wakingtimes.com by uh, Heather Callahan. Monsanto trying to hide GMO foods under the term biofortified. Biofortified. Huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do genetically engineered crops and pesticides make you think of the term biofortified? Chances are the term biofortified makes you think of vitamins and kids' cereals. Mega corporations are no strangers to propaganda and public relations. Did you know that much of our non-organic crops are grown with human sewage and sludge? No! That's because the practice is called biosolids rather than shit <laughs> to keep you in the dark. You are probably aware of the sneaky disguises that sweeteners like aspartame and high fructose corn syrup were attempted to conceal, uh, like calling itself corn sugar. <laughs> There are no power grabs out of reach for Monsanto. They are now attempting the most ridiculous propaganda scheme of all time. They are attempting to manipulate definitions under Codex Alimentarius that would allow GMOs 
to fall under the classification of biofortified foods. Codex is a collection of guidelines, codes, and other recommendations relating to foods, food production, and food safety. They were created under the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. If you are thinking this is arbitrary and wondering why our country should pay any attention to such guidelines, you're heading in the right direction. In the late 90s, consumers feared that their vitamins and supplements would move to prescription only under Codex guidelines. According to the Natu National Health Federation, the NHF, uh, is the only natural health advocate that gets a seat at Codex, by the way. It all started out innocently enough, several, innocently enough, several Codex Nutrition Committee meetings ago with an international non-governmental organization, NGO, uh, INGO for the international part, uh, named the International Food Policy Research, the IFRPI. They love their acronyms! And, <laughs> and sponsored by Harvest Plus, had one of its con country contacts introduced a proposed new work at Codex. Only member countries may introduce new work at Codex, not INGOs. Harvest Plus method of increasing certain vitamin and mineral content of basic food crops consists of uh, the time-honored conventional way of crossbreeding, not genetic engineering. Harvest Plus, for example, will increase the vitamin or iron content of sweet potatoes so that malnourished populations in developing nations will receive better nutrition. The new work at Codex Alimentarius Commission's Codes, Committee on Nutrition and Foods, Feed, for special dietary uses, the CCNFSDU <laughs> was simple. Craft a definition for biofortification. The definition could then be used uniformly around the world to apply to those foods uh, conventionally fortified with higher levels of nutrients, and everyone would be on the same page whenever the term biofortified was used. Indeed, the National National Health Federation, NHF, was an early supporter of Codex of this definition. This year's CCNFSDU meeting, hosted by the German Health Ministry in Berlin, uh, the, the first full week of December 2017, witnessed a lively debate not only about how to define biofortification, but also whether or not the very word biofortification should be used at all. However, this was not the beginning of the debate. The NHF had two delegates here. At the 2016 CCNFSDU meeting, <laughs> the chairman, Pia Noble, married a former Bear executive, had started off the biofortification definition discussion by giving her incorrect personal opinion that the definition should be as broad as possible and that the recombinant technology should be included in her uh, included her statement though directly contradicted Australia's admission of the 2015 meeting that if the committee were to refer to the original 2017 document on the scope of biofortification we would see that biofortification only refers to conventional breeding conventional breeding, and so we should clearly exclude GM techniques. In other words, the original mandate for creating biofortification definition was that it was to be defined as a process by which nutritional quality of food crops is improved through conventional plant breeding with the aim of making the nutrients bioavailable after digestion. Not surprisingly, though, the Monsanto minions got their grubby little hands on the definition through the influence peddling, influence peddling with Codex delegates and the chairwoman, and the definition began changing into one that would include genetically modified biofortified foods 
So the battle is on at Codex uh, to whether or not GM foods will be included within the definition of biofortification. I am sure, absolutely freaking positive, that Monsanto would be thrilled to be able to market its synthetic products under a name that began with the word bio. <laughs> Frumpy points out that they should make us healthier so we will be useful as soil and green. <laughs> As of 2017, the definition of biofortification, including GMOs under Codex, has morphed into the process whereby any nutrients or related substance of all potential source organisms, e.g. animal, plant, fungi, yeast, bacteria, and foods are increased by a measurable level and or become more bioavailable for the intended purposes. The process applies to any method of production and excludes conventional fortification. So, as of now, <laughs> uh, yeah, as, well, as of 2017, anyway, uh, the biofortification does include GMO products. NHF took opposition with the term biofortified, falling under these vague parts of definition. All potential source organisms... Uh, the process applies to any method of production. And, uh, yeah. I'll let you peruse more on your own, but bioavailable, yeah. You will be, you will be bioavailable exactly when you're turned into Soylent Green, Mike. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm running, I'm quickly running out. I'm going to go over. I'm going, I'm going over a little bit. Because, you know, I got I got stuff here, and and, and I, I'm spending some time on some of these things, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to stick around as I go over a little bit, because um, I got to, I have to. All right, DARPA, y'all know DARPA, y'all know and love DARPA, right? <laughs> DARPA is building a $10 million open source secure voting system. Yeah. This article is from March of 2019. Uh, on Vice.com. The system will be fully open source, bonus, good thing, and designed with newly developed secure hardware, questionable at best, to make this system not only impervious to certain kinds of hacking, not possible, not possible to be impervious, to hacking, but also allows voters to verify that their votes were recorded accurately. Well, you can record a check that your votes were recorded accurately at the voting station. That don't mean they're going to be counted accurately or counted at all down the road. <laughs> oh, boy. For years, security professionals and elect election integrity activists have been pushing voting machine vendors to build more secure and verifiable election systems so voters and candidates can be assured election outcomes have been manipulated have not been manipulated or as i said initially have been manipulated because well you can vote all you want it don't matter <laughs> Uh, or as the other saying goes, if voting actually made a difference, it would be illegal. <laughs> All right. Now they might finally get uh, get. Now they might finally get this thanks to a new ten million dollar contract. The Defense Department, uh, Defense Department, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA has launched to design and build a secure voting system that it hopes will be impervious to hacking. Now, I'm sure you've all seen other things that DARPA has done, and none of them are to your benefit. So, do you think this would be? And the whole impervious to hacking, again, not possible. Um, I'll cut this one short, but I, I, I wouldn't trust this as far as I could throw... The moon. 
wait, I could probably throw the moon pretty far if I was out there in space and had some leverage. <laughs> I mean, there's there's like no gravity or nothing out there, right? Or no uh, <laughs> atmosphere. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Enough of that. Going on, the westernjournal.com on uh, November 30th. Jeff Bezos. People have mixed opinions about Jeff Bezos. Some hate him outright. Some love him outright. And then there are others, kind of like me, that, like, I really admire his, his business acumen. I admire that a guy starting in a garage, shipping books, has built what he's built, and, to, and now is the richest man in the world. I, I have great admiration for that. Some of his other crap, I really don't like at all. That being said, Western Journal pretty much feels like I do. <laughs> Billionaire donates $98.5 million to help the homeless. But it's still not enough for the ungrateful leftists. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> It's a rare day when we're sticking up for Jeff Bezos. The Amazon owner and world's richest person has been bankrolling my, one of my most hated publications, the Washington Post. When Democracy Dies in Darkness t-shirt sales won't do the trick. So you prob can probably guess we're not on the same page. That said, Bezos can do what he wants with his money, including propping up a paper that's gone from Woodward and Bernstein to that Super Bowl commercial. He can use it on, well, stupid Super Bowl commercials. He can use it to save wild red-throated sparrows, a bird I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty sure is critically endangered in as much as I just made it up. Uh, <laughs> he can use it uh, to run political campaign to become president, as so many billionaires currently seem interested in doing. And you know how else he can certainly use it? To build housing for homeless families. That's an excellent way to use it, actually. Certainly there are a lot better than, than running Tom Hanks narrated Super Bowl ads. I'm not sure what he's talking either didn't see any Super Bowl ads, or saving made-up birds. Yet, a man who hopes to become the leader of one of the world's most powerful countries is incensed because that's not enough. And because Bezos supposedly needs to pay more taxes. Or have more, more properly stated, have more of his money stolen. So, to begin... Bezos is donating almost $100 million in order to alleviate homelessness in 23 states, according to Forbes. The announcement was made on November 21st that Bezos has donated $98.5 million to 32 organizations in 23 states that are helping homeless families. The gifts to each organization received range uh, from $1.25 million to $5 million. The Amazon founder and CEO gave the money through his Bezos Day One Fund, which he announced in September 2018. At launch, Bezos pledged $2 million to the fund, which has two area of focus, funding the work of organizations who help homeless families and creating Montessori-inspired preschools across the country. The day the new gifts were announced, Bezos filled the SEC, fi filed with the SEC, that he was donating 56,702 shares of Amazon stock worth just under 99 million to nonprofits. The timing of Bezos stock's donation made it seem like the shares could have been donated to the Day One Fund grant recipients. A spokesman for Amazon declined to comment. That's actually pretty great, and you know, he didn't need to pay Tom Hanks a single penny. So who could be angry about this? Who, I ask, could be angry that he is helping homeless people? Jeremy Corbyn, for one. <laughs> this was this was uh, this was prior to that election. So 
<laughs> anyway, the UK is about was about to was about to go to the polls thanks to the current Brexit logjam, and Corbyn is one of the two men with a realistic chance of being UK's prime minister. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Corbyn doesn't care. He doesn't care. He says Corbyn says to Jeff Bezos, "That's zero point zero nine percent of your worth. Just pay your taxes." Really, Corbin? Really, Corbin? How much are you donating? How many of your taxes, their taxes on you, are you paying? What good are you doing the world? How are you helping people? You're not. You're just wanting to steal pe money from people via taxes, taxation, and control. And I, I gotta say, hooray for Je to Jeff Bezos. For do, for doing this, I, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of things he does that I'm not real comfy with, but uh, that one I'm okay with. Yeah. All right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. November 27th, 2019. Julia Naftalin on Insider.com. Lunacy. <laughs> Pure lunacy. Now look, I, I'm as pro-life as well. Not every, not 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 the most pro-life person in the world, but very pro-life in general, and very not in favor of abortion. I don't want to say anti-abortion. I think there are cases where abortion is is, is required and needed, and play. But I I I I am against regulating. Uh, the abortion. I think people want to do it. They should be able to do it, but uh, hopefully they'd be able to understand the uh, implications of what they're doing to themselves. Uh, not not only to the to the unborn, but to themselves. Um, they've got to live with this. They, uh, it, uh, it, some people have no conscience, and I guess it doesn't really bother them, uh, but at least not right when they're doing it. Maybe further on down the line, it, it's causing some mental issues as they realize that they, they murdered what would have been their child. Uh, regardless of that, I, I, I would not, I'm against regulating the abortion and the government should not be involved in abortion. That, that's my view on it. Uh, or pretty much anything else, but this, this is the issue that we're not tackling here. Although, not actually tackling abortion with this article. It goes one step beyond. <laughs> a Pennsylvania bill would require death certificates for fertilized eggs that never implant in the uterus. You heard me right. <laughs> you heard me right. And anti-abortion anti lawmakers in Pennsylvania want to pass a bill that would require burials and, as a result, death certificates for fetal remains, uh, which in their terms include any fertilized eggs that never implanted in the person's uterus. Meaning, never had a chance to, to, to become a fetus. Never had a chance. If they don't implant in the uterus, no fetus. Fertilized eggs must divide to become a ball of cells that implants in the uterus in order for pregnancy to occur. Women and even uh, their doctors usually cannot tell when fertilized eggs don't implant in the uterus because those eggs typically dissolve in utero and are shed through the woman's menstrual lining every month, making them undetectable. But the anti-abortion lawmakers in Pennsylvania want to pass a bill that would require health providers to arrange burials or cremations for all of a person's fetal remains, which, under the lawmakers' terms, includes the fertilized eggs that never implanted in the uterus. Uh, the proposed bill also means health providers would have to obtain death certificates for all fertilized but not implanted eggs, since in order to obtain the burial permit, you first have to obtain a death certificate. Christine Castro, a, wait a, second, a burial permit. You need a permit to be buried. 
What, what's that all about? A staff attorney at the uh, Pennsylvania Women's Based Law Project told Vice, this bill is written in a misleading way. It's written in an ignorant way. I, <laughs> so I, I don't know what to tell you about it beyond that. There, there's a lot of stuff in the article. There's links to other articles. Uh, but lunacy, freaking lunacy. <laughs> Miss Grammy Mary points out here, abortion is a symptom. It's a symptom of a mindset that odes not value life. I agree, Grammy. Um, I'm not sure what the odes are, but yeah. No. Uh, this, but this, this bill, this bill, that, that, that's just freaking nuts. I, 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 don't, I, I have no idea what happened to these people. I understand being anti-abortion very much, but... Come on! <laughs> All right. And lastly, but not leastly, and by request, I bring you this little piece of lunacy. <laughs> this is the request by Miss Circle. <laughs> on on it's it's a it's not it's not really a leftover. It's December second, so a week ago. But, uh, yeah, uh, news.com.au, out of Australia there. Mums angry at naked dad in the male change room. <laughs> yeah, a woman who took to the Internet to vent after seeing a stark naked dad while in the men's changing room has sparked a huge divide. That's right. The woman was in the men's changing room, and she saw a naked man. <laughs> and she was upset. <laughs> yes, a mother who used the male men's changing room after taking her son swimming has sparked a major debate after she took to the Internet to rant about seeing a naked man. The woman described on UK parenting site Mumsnet her horror at seeing the dad of three girls strip stark naked in front of his daughters. She explained she often used the men's changing rooms while taking her two-year-old son swimming as the women's was too busy. But her views on the dads getting nude uh, were met with some criticism, with people saying they were confused by the rant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, think. One person commented, you were sat in a changing room and you were shocked to see someone getting changed. <laughs> Another said, I don't think it's weird if he's in the men's changing room. Someone else remarked, so you were upset you saw a man's penis in a men's changing room. <laughs> Excuse me. Another believed she was in the wrong for being a female in the men's changing room. The unidentified mom, who goes by the name Pink Boa, in the forum, explained in her post she didn't wait for her son by the pool because of her asthma, saying the humidity affects her breathing. So instead, she headed into the change area, the men's change area, which, by the way, they have in this article a little thing asking, do you think the mom is wrong? And uh, there's either a yes, uh, she did what she, she she did, what did she expect to see in a men's change room, or no, people shouldn't expose themselves even in a change room. And so if I click yes and cast my vote here, it says that the number of people think that think the mom is wrong is 98%. <laughs> Anyway, this woman, okay, uh, first off, why so crazy? Why so crazy about seeing somebody naked, either in the changing room or not? If you saw somebody on the beach naked, would you freak out? I mean, is that something that, that you just can't handle, a naked body somewhere? Is nakedness that offensive to you? And you're probably fine, okay, with war. Yeah, Grammy says that uh, this this mum is the perv. 
She 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 may well be a perv. She was going in there to see Petus. <laughs> I, I just don't get it. It's a naked body. Big deal. <laughs> and yeah, just stay the hell out of the man's changing room if you don't want to see uh, naked men, because you know you're going to see naked men in a naked in a, in a man's changing room. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> and people were talking about it in the article. He could have wrapped the towel around himself. Really? Is that how you? Is that how you change? You get out of the shower and you wrap. Make sure you wrap. Do, do you cover yourself up in the shower? I, I, I don't know. It's nuts. <laughs> anyway, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, to the Grim Leftovers program. Uh, by the way, this was uh, episode fifty-one, week fifty of 2019. Uh, I'll be back next week with uh, episode, uh, what? 52? Yeah. But I will, I have decided, be taking off the 23rd and the 30th. Uh, so there'll be 52 episodes for uh, whatever. I'll be taking off the last two weeks of the year and start back again in 2020. So um, I will be here next week though. So Hopefully, all will be back here with me. Uh, tomorrow is uh, is uh, in a perfect world with Flash and uh, Vinny Vin E. So uh, at one p.m. Eastern, check that out. Check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com dot com for all of the rest of the shows here on Real Liberty uh, R R RLM Radio. By the way, we have a new show coming starting on Wednesday on Wednesdays, which is it's a new show to us. It's not a new show. Uh, it's uh, a Lon Lonnie Clark, uh, and uh, I think she will be on at noon on Wednesday, I do believe, uh, with her with her premier RLM radio show. So check check her out. Um, she probably very interesting, and uh, so we'll we'll see we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Anything else to tell you about? Oh, Friday is is Moose Girl's birthday. Moose Girl will be twenty nine. Mm. Or so. Um, so, happy birthday to Moose Girl coming up on Friday. Uh, so, everybody go over there and, uh, and right on the butt. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll talk to you all later. And uh, that's it. Peace.